Che Appalachia Show. We're excited. I'm excited. Why are you here? Dude, these guys are amazing. I hope that everybody hears their songs and, <laughs> and heeds their yeah. message. Yeah. I, absolutely. I found them on Spotify several weeks ago and have been hooked ever since I heard their song, The Dreamer. Yeah. yeah. Nice. Whoa. Our roommate said that it was her favorite band at Winter Wondergrass. That she saw her favorite new band and she was like, you have to watch them. Nice. Because Bailiff like produced her album. Yeah. Yeah, and Bela as well. Anything Bela. Bela. Yeah. Basically. Oh, yeah. I really like Argentina. Yeah. So here we go. We're going to take our time travel unit and go travel back in time to when Che Appalachia was in my living room and the world was a different place. Here we go. <laughs> Welcome to the River of Suck podcast. For the first time ever, we don't have one guest. We have four guests and together they're all the band Che Appalachia. Hello. Hey. hey. Hola. We've got Joe. We've got Pau. We've got Franco, we got Martin. Yeah. One of our big core concepts is the idea of the USU. You want to be the USU that you can be, which is something I heard Victor Wooten say a long time ago. Especially Joe, you have the biggest USU story probably in the history of this podcast in terms of finding yourself and your place in music in the world, right? I would vouch for that statement. Because it was, it, <laughs> there was a lot of searching and trying to bring incongruencies together in, in the life of a bluegrass musician, which was my life as a bluegrass musician. You grew up in Winston Salem, North Carolina. North Carolina, yeah. And you realized at a young age that you were gay. Mm -hmm. I realized it consciously at age fourteen, but uh -huh. as I look, you know, as I look back, I I could have realized it earlier. At some point, you left the country. Yeah, there's this, there's just something that always I felt was unsettling about the United States and just the the general aesthetic mm -hmm. and uh, angst and place in world history, and also uh, puritanism and shame and I had I had this uh, inkling of an idea that. Uh, Spanish, the Spanish speaking world, you know, both the Spanish people and Southern European Mediterranean people and also Latin Americans were something I could really vibe with. Mm -hmm. And, uh, my intuition was, was pretty correct. I feel pretty at home in, in, in those cultures. I feel sort of not so at home in Appalachia or from where I'm from. Mm -hmm. I just feel like kind of, I don't know, for some reason, I feel like, uh, that, there's some part of me that that it could not be completed by the typical character assets you find represented in the region of the world in which <laughs> I was born. I don't know why, but but I do love touchy feely cultures, you know, uh -huh. physical touching and uh, oh, yeah, and other and other uh, in, uh, in cultures where masculinity isn't so dude guy bro man, right? you know, like where you can kiss <laughs> someone on the cheek, you can be sensitive, you can cry together and that kind of thing. Sure. You can hold each other's hands and watch a romantic movie and. Oh, that's what I do with my with gay, your, my, yeah. my gay, uh, you know, people. Yeah. Uh, but even even amongst heterosexuals and uh, non queers, it's a very, you know, Argentina particularly is a much more, I think, supple version of masculinity. So I was <laughs> very attracted to to that and did some rambling before I ended up in Argentina, in Spain, and Japan. Just struck a wanderlust, and I felt like you know, typical tobacco town faggot. Was going to have AIDS. That's all a gay person could be. The only, Ooh. the only, yeah, I know, right? I mean, well, that's the imagery I was given when I was a kid. So basically, our only hopes for a normalized gay person was uh, Pedro in the real world, because I'm an old millennial. Yeah. So when I was, a, well, I was an adolescent, it was a guy that actually died of AIDS. That was our biggest, uh, really cool guy. But he was like the one guy that was in, in media. So I didn't have, and I didn't know any out gay people. It was yeah. Very isolating. Huh. Times have changed a lot, though. You know. Yeah, I moved down to Argentina uh, ten years ago, with no intentions of anything. I just wanted to go because I liked Argentinians. I'd lived with Argentinians in Spain, and one of my best friends 
uh, Walter Garcia, he said, okay, you just kind of lost, boy. I was like on the bluegrass circuit. <laughs> I was playing fiddle with Town Mountain. Awesome band, by the way. Yeah. And, uh, but I was just kind of like, what am I doing? I'm not, this is not me. I'm not the, I'm not the meest me yeah. yet. So I was in that proverbial search of the USU, you know, seriously. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I was like intent on what the hell am I? And why do, why do I feel this incongruency? Bluegrass is like the biggest love and Appalachian stream band music is my biggest love, but it just did something wasn't working. And then, uh, then Argentina, I ended up getting a bunch of students. I just put up, I set up shop as a bluegrass teacher and a lot of people ended up wanting to take classes, uh, mostly bluegrass banjo classes, well, banjo classes. And, uh, anyway, so these guys showed up looking for banjo classes and that's how we met. We're all multi-instrumentalists, but they, right. uh, were interested in the plinky plank and uh, I was teaching plinking planking. Yeah, nice timing there. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Any of you want to weigh in on what makes you feel like the USU and how you got to figure that out? It's a deep question, but um, to me particularly, I'm still searching. And maybe that makes me the me me, probably. Yeah, the search is real. The search is a... Uh, is, uh, is the answer. I mean, yeah, I might never find it. Me asked me, and that's cool. I'm a skier, not a snowboarder, but my favorite snowboarder's name is Jeremy Jones, and he has a he has a saying called "The journey is the reward," mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. which is a beautiful totally way I think that. of saying it's very it. Very cool. But the art of becoming yourself is is possible, you know, too. Yeah, a little bit. I I have <clears throat> a moment where I feel myself, uh-huh. and that's when. When I do the things that I like to do, like writing music mm-hmm. and playing music, surfing, talking with, with a friend. Nice. Yeah. Uh, I always kind of felt like uh, the me is me. I mean, in my family and kind of the, the black sheep and <laughs> I'm not that black sheep, but in my family I am. And wherever, whatever group of friends I have, I always feel like the different one, and I guess I'm not. I'm never sure, but I guess feeling different is what I like. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, totally. I think Chiapalachi for all of us has been an, a really awesome way of exploring the deepest ourselves because it's like we are getting to be a road dog and bluegrass band like very few bands are like who the hell does two and a half month tours like (laughs) they did back in the day that's what we do we get in a minivan and we drive all across the country we sleep on people's floors it's not been glamorous and not every band can say they've actually gone through that so i think it's like the most bluegrass thing you could do is actually just you know get out on the road and play bluegrass all over the place and And to be a, a, a tour musician to be a tour musician, you have to um, be sure of what you are, because you yeah. always have to prove that in the stage, on the stage. Hmm. That's right. And that's usually where it's fun. Yeah. Because it's <laughs> like people can either come along with us or not. Sometimes they. And it's a. Don't. How do you say def- desafiante? It's challenging. Challenging. Yeah. Mm. Always. I'm curious about when they're, I mean, I saw you guys at Rocky Grass last year. You had a standing ovation at noon and I saw zero other standing ovations for any other band at any time of the day. And it was like 90 degree hot sun. That was, that was cool. But you just mentioned that sometimes people aren't aren't always vibing. Do you think that's because of the politics or it's a little mixture of everything? There's a lot of bass player. Yeah, there's so many, so many, like so many opinions. To, there's enough opinion, opinions in the world to choke a donkey. That's why knowing your knowing yourself within that constant opining going on around you about you is challenging too. It's like you get too many people chiming in on what you are to really find a sense of self, and we all struggle with that. Obviously, you know. Yeah. But there, there has been in my personal life with Chiapalachi, I think the, the guys have really helped me come into myself. Cause like I always had this dream of bluegrass, but it wasn't working as the typical like North Carolina bluegrass band kind of thing. It was like, but so, but we're a Buenos Aires based tri-national bluegrass band. And that's like a, a more, <laughs> it's like a more 
beautiful expression of uh of the globalized people that we are and they're they're in the same boat because they're complete anomalies you know what i mean Mm -hmm. latin american bluegrass musicians don't it's not a thing they don't exist they're inventing that you know in their in in their expression of self so as a band that collectively like fuels the fire of each of our own individual identities i think and i think we're all through this band really connecting with something so us yeah and as we connect with ourselves personally we're stronger as a unit cool yeah is that fair to say? I think I think that's yeah, pretty fair to say. Spot on. It's been a journey. I mean, we are journey, definitely yeah. on a journey. The four of us together. <laughs> <laughs> One of the members of the River of Suck swim team asked a question that I think you just answered, which is just, "What are the strengths and challenges from combining these cultural backgrounds?" But to me, it sounds like your USU on your new instruments brings you closer as a unit. Mm-hmm. Has there been anything challenging about that? I think the most challenging are more technical stuff, like how do we mix this kind of music with this other, or how do we make this percussion sound good in a string quartet that doesn't have... Those are like the challenges. But then the strengths are in the fact that it's very authentic and it's very us. Yeah. So a lot of things come very naturally, and that's the strength in it. But then the complications are just technicalities, I think, just... Or maybe the life of a touring musician is complicated by we, itself. But. It's very much the bluegrass mentality. Well, just get it done. Yeah. At some much. point, we, we, we really, as a band, also, like, in our band history, yeah. when we finally got to Appalachia, that's where, like, oh, we are Che Appalachia. Okay. Like, this is a thing. Like, at Clifftop and Galax the first year, that was where the band, we were like, oh, we are a band. Like, we were a Latin American bluegrass band without the, as, as a unit, without having experienced the festival culture hmm. and then as soon as we did i saw them like light up and i was like oh yes <laughs> it worked they're lifers <laughs> like they had more fun than i had and i was like and they and we've been back every year since yeah. like for three straight years this will be the fourth year that we go to clifftop yeah. and uh paul and i are going to galax so uh cool. you know clifftop was our my first our first uh string band music uh, how is gathering it no um, festival Convention. All Fiddler's Convention. Convention. Fiddler's Convention. Convention. Fiddler's Convention. Fiddler's Con- it, it was really life-changing, I think, for all of us. Uh, I love Clifton, and I love Gaylax also. Yeah. And I love the vibe and just camping for a week and then playing music all day long with different people. And this thing. I'm known to have a few whiskeys and start crying, but that week, I mean, I broke into <laughs> tears, like, just so many times. It's like, oh, my God, this is so beautiful. It's like the perfect, like, Latin America merged with Appalachia. In like mm-hmm. in exper- an experiential way, and it, we they, we were all there, and it was just like, yeah. oh my god, it's actually happening. So you had the name before you went there. Yeah, yep. we had a CD. We made a we made an album. Uh, Latin grass. Yeah, Latin in grass. four months. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and the name thing is funny because the band was actually called the Silver River String Band. But no one could pronounce it or you know how to write it in Buenos Aires, oh. or most people couldn't. Silver so River. we changed it to something easy for people in Buenos Aires, <laughs> Che Apalache. Yeah. And now here, no one can pronounce Che Apalache or you know how to We have it a or... very, very uh, smart s- business sense, yes. Very intelligent. <laughs> We've heard it all. And now, Che Apalache! Chipalapchus! <laughs> che Apache! Che Apache! Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. che that's the most che common. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's the most, common, most common for some reason. I like that. Mixing in more. I think it's time we got into the river of suck. (laughs) So the river of suck is a mythical imaginary river where you're on one side behind you is your comfort cave. You're on your comfort shore. It's where everything is easy. Things you already know how to do. When you squint and you look across the other side of the river of suck, you can see future versions of yourself who can do the things you wish you could do now. But the problem is in between here and the other side is a bunch of raging whitewater rapids and rocks and thought piranhas. And those thought piranhas are those negative thoughts that come into your head and try and sabotage your good vibes. Now, when we started this, I thought, thought piranhas were bad 
But it turns out Thought Piranhas are actually on the River of Suck swim team. It's it's just another deep, dark part of our brain trying to help ourselves. But uh, it doesn't always help in the most constructive way, you know. But you picked up the banjo power, and Martin, you picked up the mandolin, mm-hmm. like, more recently. That wasn't your first musical instrument. No. So what were your primary instruments before, and how did you kind of cross that river of suck? I mean, the idea is you have to suck at something before you can be good at it, right? Yeah, I'm yeah. still in that part. Oh, yeah? I'm still sucking. <laughs> um, so I started with guitar when I was 14, but I am I have a, a disease that whenever I see someone doing something cool, I want to be that person doing that. <laughs> so that happens a lot with musical instruments. Oh, yeah. So I try to play a lot of instruments. And I've played the trumpet, I played the bass, the drums, the bagpipes. I tried playing the piano, I, tr- I played a little bit of fiddle, I played banjo. Island pipes or Scottish Highland pipes? Uh, Gaita Gache- Marcial Gallega. It's called like uh, Marshall uh, Spanish. Galician. Oh, Galician. the Galician yeah. bagpipes. Cool. Yeah. yeah but it's like a weird yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of new, but it's not that new. Yeah. So I was actually trying to play bluegrass banjo when. Uh, when I met Joe, and then when they invited me to play with them, and they already had a banjo player, and they told me <laughs> if I knew how to play mandolin, and I kind of wanted to, I had so that was a good excuse for me to buy a mandolin and learn how to play it. Yeah, and that, that was, was four years ago. That was valiant. He like picked up the instrument to join the band, basically. I mean, I didn't know I mean. we were kind of just jamming at the moment. It was kind of a jamming situation, but I liked it. But you're saying you still suck. So you're in front of people every night, and you're like. <laughs> yes, um, but I mean I'm better than I was. Yeah. But I still feel like I have a super long way to go, and one of these uh, piranha thoughts. What was it? Piranha. Yeah, piranha thoughts. They're like tiny fish. Yeah. That really. Piranhas. Yeah. 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 I mean, me feel like maybe now I'm 32, and it's like, am I too old to get really, really better at this? Or I mean, <laughs> this, this is my top. So. Uh, I want to get better, and I know we'll see if it happens. <laughs> well, but it's happening on stage every night. Well, I I know my part. But don't you take some solos? To I know the them. same solo. Oh, okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But that's the what that's what's most most difficult for me to uh-huh. improvise in part. Okay. I'm not ready to do it on stage. Right. Mm-hmm. Someday. That's cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah, in my uh, personal experience, I could say banjo is now my main instrument because I started playing bass. I started playing electric bass and it actually comes more naturally to me, like it's Mm. easier to learn it. But I started playing the banjo after one year of playing bass. And this was when I was 19, 20 years old. So this is 2010, 2009. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, so pretty much I started playing the banjo when I was still a baby musically speaking <laughs> you know and I I have a lot more training in ba- like serious training in banjo than in bass although bass is a little bit easier maybe to learn for me I don't have the training because I don't do it anymore I don't have a band where I play the bass or anything but yeah it's kind of I think one of the biggest uh, thought piranhas that I have is kind of the same as Martin said when I started playing and I was like 19 20 years old uh, the friend that told me let's make a band he was singing and playing guitar since he was a kid oh yeah and I found out as a musician through my way I have came across so many people that play since they're kids and they're so virtuosos and so good that it's a haunting thought like saying am I too late to start doing this <laughs> but then I stopped thinking that a long time ago because <laughs> I enjoy it a lot and I, I like it. I like what I do. So I don't, and I encourage people. I, when sure. I started teaching banjo in Argentina, I had a, a, a student that's about 40 years old and he just wanted to start playing banjo. Yeah. And then he got really into it and he uses it as a hobby because he's a veterinarian, but I encourage him. It's like, it's not too late. You can, if you enjoy it, you can play it. I mean, just do it. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's 70-year-olds who wish they started when they were 60, and 80-year-old right. beginners wish they started when they were 70. So, But then there's like a personality trait that I know musicians, friends of mine, that get di- discouraged yeah. when they see some someone younger, way younger, and playing way better, and they're like, damn, I can't believe this, and they get discouraged. I don't. I get, I get like, oh, I want to play better, and I have to be better, yeah. and it's like, 
motivating. So that's, I think that's a positive thing. I feel like that's a conscious choice that we have to make to be inspired instead of deflated. Because yeah. just if our brain is left to its own devices, it goes negative. It's like, oh man, look at them. They're so <laughs> great. I suck. But on the other side of that negativity yeah. is a, a an ethereal plane of who cares. Yeah. So once you once you torture yourself for years and years and years, and you realize, oh my god, I suck. Oh my god, I suck. And then you're eventually like, I don't care about thinking about how much I suck anymore. And that that that's where I'm at. Mm-hmm. I do not care anymore. I cared for so long, and I was so competitive. And I sucked so bad compared to... I could name a hundred people, including yourself, that I would, don't want to play violin in the presence of. But I do not care anymore. Yeah. And but that, I also think that thinking that way, like uh, being critic of yourself and these kind of thoughts, if you have the right mind attitude, you kind of get better. Yeah. It's, an way, it's a good incentive to get better because I, I don't think I... You were talking about Victor Wooden a mm-hmm. little while ago. I learn a lot about him and what he says and i don't think you ever get to a moment where you are like okay i'm the best version of myself now yeah. i can play how i'm supposed to play and right is if you get to that point then you're thinking wrong and you're just <laughs> kind of getting stuck in a place sure i mean you always can get better no matter how good you are you always yeah. can get better also we learned that it doesn't really matter you don't have to be the most virtuoso band ever like people, yeah. Like people like us, anyway. And sometimes they cry, and sometimes they well, they really enjoy it, even though if if we are not the best musicians ever. Virtuosity is a double-edged sword in a way. Uh, there's a lot of virtuoso musicians who sell themselves short in their ability to communicate something to yeah other people. It just right. this just happens. You see, you know. There's a lot of pitfalls to that um, desire to be, I guess it's this desire to be the best. Now, and then I will make, I have to make another statement. There are some people that are just so naturally good that it transcends the longing to be virtuoso. Like there's, there is, there is a, there's a level of player out there that is just a flow and it's like, whoa, uh, I'm not that guy at all. (laughs) It never will be. But there is something to be said for making art uh, with like actually enjoying your limitations in a way, challenging mm-hmm. yourself to get better. You know, you've got to do that. That's what yeah. we, we do that. We really do challenge ourselves, but we also are like with the newest material that we're working on. That's not in the public sphere yet. We're really taking a step back and being like, okay, well we can do this really well. Why don't we do that instead of yeah. pushing it so far and, and, you know, having such a challenge all the time, you know, there's something to be said for that. I mean, that's maybe just taking other people's expectations off of what you're doing and, Exactly. Yeah. And maybe we we think that we suck when <laughs> uh, we are trying to sound like another person. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes. So you are expecting something else than yeah. yourself. I think that's when you think you suck. And everyone in this band, I, I mean, I speak for myself, but I think everyone would be um, in agreement with this statement. We do feel confident about what we do on stage. Yeah, absolutely. We do feel confident about yeah. what we're presenting. Yeah. We're, we don't doubt it. It does not matter to us what other people think about it. Right. And that I think that's coming from an honest place because we do sacrifice. Like I said, we do two and a half month tours <laughs> and we have uh, our personal lives have taken the hit. And we're, so we redo. We're not we're not out here um, yeah. screwing around, you know. The USU thing is, I think, part of of just finding your own voice. Like, Martin, you're finding your own voice on the mandolin. That transcends, like, how many notes can you play the fastest? Like, you're not Chris Thiele. No. I will never be. No. No. He is Chris Thiele. But who are you? I'm Martin. And he will never not be Chris Thiele. (laughs) Yeah. I will never... Chris Chris Thiele will never be you. And I will never not be Martin. That's right. Mm -hmm. So if you're still... We agree. Yeah. (laughs) So, that was so profound. Yeah. <laughs> you're, you're never going to be another person. You, what are you going to do, and man? Yeah. Now I remember being younger. I sort of remember it. And uh, thinking like, uh, why can't I be like uh, Kurt Cobain or whatever? And like, damn it, there's, I will never be them because it was in another time. And then I kind of learned that whoever you are and whatever music you do, 
someone will like you. And if someone ever says, I want to be that person,、mm -hmm. then nothing would happen. But it would be, it would be nice. <laughs> Contar la historia de cómo querías presentar el, el dúo nuestro. Eso está bueno.、Uh, ok, this is going to be very difficult to articulate. Ok. But I was thinking of doing a new like, introduction to a song where、uh, Franco and I just play uh, uh, bluegrass. Yeah. Guitar and mandolin. And we were doing a Monroe Brothers song and we want to do another one. I've been doing the introduction for so long, I want to change it. So. I think this goes along with the river of suck. I was thinking of doing something like saying, like,、uh, we're going to do a bluegrass now, two Argentinians playing bluegrass. Yeah. And I imagine, like,、uh, some、uh, USA people coming、uh, to Argentina and saying, we're going to play a chacarera for you now. Chacarera. Yeah. And then I thought of saying, like, no, that probably would be better than us. And then I thought, <laughs> what's wrong with me and with my self esteem that I'm making up this? People who should be bad at something, like in this, in th in this <laughs> yeah, hypothetical, hypothetical, yeah, that's what you say? Yeah, yeah. And then in my imagination, I make them better than me. Yeah. What's wrong with me? Nothing. <laughs> it's like, well, yeah, but、uh, I, th yeah. I think it's、right. funny. That, that,、yeah. That's kind of the way I think. That's the me as me. I like to be worse than <laughs> everyone else. That's what keeps us growing, the uncomfortable situations. So I think the people who run towards the uncomfortable situations grow the fastest. Yeah, this has been, has been uncomfortable from the beginning.、Uh, I remember、uh, thinking, like, okay, I'm comfortable not going on tour, but I like to be out of comfort, being comfortable. Yeah, yeah. Totally. So, what are mistakes? Are they real? Happy accidents. That's what Bob Ross says. There's no mistakes,、right. only happy accidents. Well, there is, a, there is something to be said. There is such thing as a mistake.、I'm、on a practical, on a, like a pragmatic level, like if you screw up, you screwed up. You lost your concentration. It's not like it stems from, it happens constantly.、Mm -hmm. But it's just, okay, yeah, come on, get, let's get it together. Let's, let's, let's keep going. Let's, let's try to, you know, we, we, we don't want to make mistakes. They happen all the time, unfortunately.、Right. But. It's just, it's, I mean. Un, un tropezón no es caída. Yeah. A tripping, getting tripped up is not falling down. Yeah. So we try to avoid the falling down. Right, right, right. But you mentioned losing your concentration. I'm curious how you, like, what's going on in your head when you're playing music that, that helps you be、I、in that flow state? Oh, you mean the good time or the bad time? Either one. So when, <laughs> whenever we are like two months on tour. Yeah. And we got some.、Uh, Like, we, you need the energy feedback from the audience. Yeah. w e l you're not getting that, and you're not like,、uh, and you're kind of feeling automatized、mm -hmm. or whatever,、mm -hmm. you start thinking of other stuff instead of what you're doing. <laughs> but you hands kind of know what you have to do, but then you're not thinking about it and you're not very much into it if you, you don't feel like people is like,、uh, Giving you back the energy yeah, you need. And a lot of times, also,、uh, I could add to what Martin's saying. Maybe you、uh, did, did, don't commit any mistake. You're playing everything that how you are supposed to play it, but you're not into it. Yeah. That might feel, as from the audience perspective, that might not transmit so much. But then if、mm. you're like really giving it and feeling it, you might do a little mistake. You might even know it, be noticeable and even laugh of it, like, ha,、huh, and keep <laughs> playing. But if the energy is right, I、mm -hmm. think if I were the audience, I prefer to see. The music,、uh, the musicians being into it. Yeah. And maybe screwing up a little bit, but being really into it, than playing everything perfect with a boring face. Like, you know, I, I nobody、agree. could see my boring face. I agree face, with that line of thought, but at、face. the same time, I think that there is.、Um, It's all illusion, but really what, what you perceive from another per, like what another person's thinking about you. It's, it doesn't, it's not really worth thinking about. It's just if you can be. In your happy space, that's the best because it feels better. Right. And so, that, and I think that does impact people. But at the same time, sometimes you feel great about what you're doing and it's not impacting people. Like you get to the end of the song and the slow clap develops. You're like, oh my God, we just killed it. <laughs> But they're not with us. <laughs> so, that, that brings in piranha thoughts. Yeah. Like, wait, what? How could that be? And it's just like, 
if you, if you you can't concentrate on that being a stage performer, you know, it just doesn't it doesn't matter. It's like okay, second up, this guild will end. There'll be another tomorrow. Let's keep on. Get back in the minivan. Yeah. But like what I was saying, like there's always someone who will like you, and whatever. If if we would to play, if we were to play, if we were to play, if we were to play in a, like a heavy metal show, but in between the bands, yeah, they wouldn't like us probably. But maybe some, some of them would. would I, I bet but they would. Maybe some of them, but. Uh, <laughs> We wouldn't uh, if we based our confidence on that. Yeah, that would be a mistake, I think. Yeah, I I played a show as a duo with with my wife. Our our band our duo is called Half Pelican, mm-hmm. and uh, there was five bands, and we were in the middle. Two rock bands on either side of us, uh-huh. and we were just fiddle and cello. I was like, what are we gonna do? Yeah. And then. They just turned us up so we were loud, and there's thunderous cello, and it's like it doesn't matter. Yeah. I mean, you guys don't even have a bass player, and yet you're still no one's complaining about your lack of bass player because you have a sick guitar player. Yeah, you know that makes a big holds d- down the low end really well, and, and also Paul sings the bass parts a lot. Uh, oh yeah, I do. So we can, we get we try, we we cover it as low as that like cello C pretty well. Yeah, and that that in a way I think gives your music a little more space. Oh yeah, the absence of a bass also gives the van a lot more space. The van, yeah. <laughs> the van, the van of the band. But we say we we you know we we are all in agree in agreement um, that if if the right bass player shows up, okay, that that can With happen. A, and if he owns a really big car, or she, he or she, yeah, you know, mm-hmm. or they, or they, they, yeah, yeah. Well, then you'll have to upgrade. You'll have to be in a. You'll you'll have to, you're in a minivan. You'll be in a van. That would be nice. Those those fit bases, but we're thinking more current. monster truck actually. Yeah, yeah monster we're truck. Thinking about that yeah, there you here. go. That would be funny. <laughs> Just show up everywhere in a monster truck. <laughs> it would be not comfortable for the the <laughs> our <laughs> suitcases and whatever. And yeah. Yeah, we have to Does devise that a matter pulley system. If you're driving a monster truck, like, no, oh, we just no. would wear one <laughs> pair of underwear once, <laughs> and it just use that the whole tour. Yeah, and we wouldn't even play. We'd just show up in the monster truck, and we'd be like, "Oh my god, they're so cool!" The venue. Yeah. So, <laughs> so next time, if you come just back, to pour Colorado, beer, pour <laughs> beer on top of people. <laughs> yeah. My house gets flattened. I'll know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Screw you guys! We love Campalachis! Okay. <laughs> and they're not even playing. They knocked <laughs> my house down! <laughs> Thank them. you so much! <laughs> I'm always wondering how people get to the, the right mental state before a show for a performance. Sometimes it's like there's nervousness, sometimes there's just like how do you how do you as a band collectively try and like mind meld and bring it together? Um, we need to make some noise with our instruments, like to warm up a little bit. Mm-hmm. And usually, at least for me, maybe one beer or half a beer helps to be more mm. relaxed. Uh, you don't need to be drunk. Yeah. In, in fact, it's better if you're not drunk. <laughs> of course. But just something to be more relaxed. Yeah, we're an IPA uh, before we walk on stage kind of band. Yeah. And then we're an IPA at set break kind of band. And then <laughs> after the gig. Two or three more. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it, I, I don't have to drink in my case. I can go to the stage without drinking. Okay. Yeah. Well, we all can. I mean, yeah, of course we sometimes can. Sometimes we do. Sometimes but, they don't know. give us beer and we mm-hmm. do it anyway. Yeah, I mean, it's fine. But it is it is, it is is nice to, to be a little bit less um, inhibited. I love beer. I'm a home brewer. You're tasting my beer right now. It's very good. How do these sober people, totally sober people, get to that same flow state without drinking, you know? You should ask sober people. <laughs> ask yeah. sober people. Yeah, don't ask us. <laughs> For me, it's, it's normal. It's like a... Yeah. It's playing music. And... I don't know. I can do it without beer. Yeah. Always. We, yeah. Like, we mm-hmm. all can do it without yeah, beer. But I, 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 can, I, I can do it always. Like... I, I, I can agree with both of them. I can always play without a beer, <laughs> but if I have one beer... I, that might be yeah, good. man, I'm yeah. totally all about not drinking, but I drink every time I play. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, that's yeah. basically what Paul's saying. I think, I think in my brain there's some sort of uh, connection between beer and music. Yeah, maybe from um of my experiences with beer and music. Mm-hmm. And sometimes when I go to see a to watch a band and feel like I need to hold something and to drink out uh, from it, you know. And when yeah. I do, I feel like I'm enjoying the music way better. 
And I'm not saying this is uh, correct or what it's supposed to be, but this is how I feel it. Sure. I'll, and this, these are yeah. things that might change over the course of a person's life. I have like, you know, on the, la on the last huge tour we did, I went completely straight edge and did this really radical keto diet. And we had great performances. I mean, it was something I like you can mm -hmm. just depends when you're a road dog, like life changes. Like you have to really like if making a simple change, like I'm not consuming alcohol. That's radical. Yeah. And you're a road musician. <laughs> yeah. you know I mean? so it's like it just it ebbs and flows. We're not like we never play drunk. Yeah, we, we definitely play with a couple beers. Yeah. So there's a big difference there, you know. You guys have feelings? No. Oh yeah. yeah what's I your don't. What's your relationship to your feelings? Uh, you want me to start? I'm I'm incredibly emotional. Like I'm very sensitive. Uh, I'm a very sensitive person. Cry and laugh and uh, and float around in that headspace very frequently. So I don't have any problem with with being. I, I fluctuate emotionally. Uh, well, ha happy emotions are. And positive emotions are easy. Yeah. I think Sad most people have, are happy, have though, trouble. Way, yeah. so, okay. Like melancholy is one of the reasons I love Argentina so much. And I, I think Chiapalaji has a very melancholic air in a lot of what we do. Mm -hmm. uh, we're, we're, we, we rejoice in sort of trying to bring meaning to that, that space. You know, there's a lot of that in our, in our music. Yeah. Cause a lot of people just have trouble with the negative emotions. Mm -hmm. They get, that's where they get bogged down. They get stuck yeah. in, yeah. Uh, I kind of hide my feelings I, uh, with jokes and stuff. Uh -huh. um, but I'm also usually just saying whatever I think. And sometimes that's when I get uh, angry or sad or whatever, when I don't say what I think. Uh, yeah. So I'm usually, if I'm ha angry or I've, whatever, I just say it. And I think that kind of evens it out. But uh, yeah, I'm not, I don't like feeling bad. I like. <laughs> feeling good but do you feel bad yes <laughs> but i just try to you know uh hide that huh. don't be in that uh, are you hiding it from other people or are you hiding it from yourself both huh. i like to be happy i know it's wrong but yeah i'm going i'm starting uh what do you say uh psycholo therapy therapy, therapy when i go back yeah, yeah i decided oh cool it's great for you. I, did, I, I have recently gone through uh, psychotherapy in Buenos Aires. Great place for psychotherapy, actually. And it's made a world of difference. A world of difference. To process, you know, like processing life is hard. Yeah. And uh, I don't know. I, I'm seeing big results in psychotherapy. The interpretation of my own dreams and working with a therapist has been really good. Mm, yeah. I think I am an intense person. I like <laughs> to feel more yeah. than think. Huh. So I I think I work more with the side of feelings, and sometimes that uh, that's contraproducente. Yeah, um, contraproducente. It's uh, in, uh, unproductive or an unproductive. Yeah. What's the word? I forget the English. <laughs> Anti-productive. Uh, uh, yeah, Anti-productive. Like oh. it's uh, it's the opposite or, of productive. I don't know. I like I, for words. me it works. <laughs> I I like to feel yeah. the things, and not to think. Mm -hmm more than feeling wow cool well i would say that as martin was saying and i don't think nobody likes to feel bad uh, or being bad emotionally in a bad place but it's kind of necessary to enjoy the happiness mm -hmm. and that's how life works basically so when i'm sad i know i'm sad and I love having friends. I have a bunch of friends who I trust very deeply and are very close friends which who I can talk about everything yeah. when I'm having trouble or anything. So I think that's very important in someone's life. And then you just go through the bad stuff and then the sun comes out <laughs> sometime. And then you enjoy your happy moments and what then something the happens. What does Bob <laughs> Ross say about it? Uh, he says something about that. He says that every dream needs a little friend on the side. He does? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then he paints it. Were you thinking of something else? Yes, but I will have to Google it. <laughs> Millennials. <laughs> Millennials. <laughs> For God's sake. <laughs> you know what brought everyone to their feet at Rocky Grass was the wall. Mm 
which I noticed is on your first album and your second album. Yeah, so Bela, it seem, wa- it Bela seems wanted like to, to, to have it on this album, too. We were like, oh, we've already recorded it. He's like, no, that's going on there. We're like, okay. Yeah, I mean, I feel like I feel like that's a pretty... Even though it doesn't have your instruments in it, it's mm-hmm. just such an amazing song that really makes people feel feel the most you've really captured the moment i think of, of the, the zeitgeist the, the world that that we live in and actually you guys probably know lula wiles yeah those folks they actually um take a moment have you seen them perform no okay so the, in the middle of their show they're they're like we're gonna stop playing music now and make you feel uncomfortable i like that and then they get, a couple of them will give a speech about you know, uh, like one of them is is from a Native American tribe, and they'll give a speech about oppression and things that make people feel un- uncomfortable. And I like about your music that you're not just playing music that makes you feel happy. You're dealing with real issues. But, you know, I am so sick of walking on eggshells. For people. Yeah. Thankfully, we're at a point in our career where we can start just say, calling them like we see them. You know, I mean, and I have to do that more. These guys are on work visas here. They ain't here to be sociopolitical. They can't be so political, you know? But I can. And I have we no... Have no opinions. I have no <laughs> problem. <laughs> 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 like, I mean... When sure. You, sure. So, as a, as, like, as a band, we went down to the wall. We went down to the border, the borderlands, yeah. and we were walking around in the desert, and we saw, you know, uh, graves for anonymous people, people who had died there. One of them was an adolescent yeah. kid. We're standing over that grave. And then we went to the federal courthouse in Tucson, Arizona, where they're processing migrants who've been detained in Operation Streamline. And then we went to Nogales, Mexico, and we're seeing where migrants are preyed upon by drug cartels and they're, they're sold into sex slavery. And all these things are happening. And it has a lot to do with American interventionism in Latin America. Yeah, These are realities. There's truth. There's a... There is a there's truth in the universe, and that is so hard for people to. We're not talking about, um, we're not we're not taking a stance on something. Though we, are, I mean, we take a political stance, but the content of what we're saying is actually true, <laughs> factual. Yeah. And that, and that and that's something so radical these days. But you know what? I don't mind ruffling the feathers of a bunch of white men in Middle America. It doesn't yeah. doesn't matter to me. They've they're the same ones that cast me off as a pontificating loudmouth faggot. He just needs to shut the hell up. And he's like, come on. I don't care if I ruffle their feathers. And if arts presenters just like, oh, we don't want to ruffle our constituents' feathers. Yeah. They're the ones, okay, well then don't hire us, sweetheart. We don't care. <laughs> yeah. We'll get other gigs. Yeah. Take it or leave it. We ain't changing yeah. this song. Okay. And Donald Trump <laughs> is a psychopath, a horrible person, and he should not be the president of the United States of America. I just want to say what Joe thinks does not necessarily represent the opinion of everybody in this band. But it might. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's yeah, for legal yeah, protection. That's for legal, pur- that's for legal <laughs> protection. I appreciate that you guys are using your, your platform of music to actually say something that you believe in. You know? So I yeah, think and I, it's something that, like, you know, that has been usurped from traditional music in the southeast you know what i mean like uh rural the rural left is has all but disappeared for some reason oh Mm. it's still there actually i mean there's a lot of you know leftist rural people and they just they need better channels to get their um truest selves out into the world and che apalachi might tap into that a little bit because we do play traditional bluegrass and there's not many young male uh vocal groups that are singing four-part Appalachian gospel. You know young I mean? and handsome. Young and handsome. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, can we uh, make people uncomfortable here? Hell also? yeah. Uh, there's a poem we wrote, we read and when we were down uh, near the border. and uh, In this near guy Salmita, Randy, Arizona. Yeah, mm-hmm. this guy Randy took us to see those places where people died. Did you did you write it? No, no. Oh, uh, you, this is yeah. by... Uh, I think it's pronounced Warsenshire. I don't know how it's pronounced, but I'm going to pronounce it like this. Warsenshire is a British Somali poet. Okay, yeah. Do you want to read it? Sure, if you want. Yeah. yeah. I haven't read it uh, in a while. So. But you have better pronunciation. Home. No one leaves home unless home is the mouth of a shark. You only run for the border when you see the whole city running as well. 
your neighbor's running faster than you. The boy you went to school with, who kissed you dizzy behind the old tin factory, is holding a gun bigger than his body. You only leave home when home won't let you stay. No one would leave home unless home chased you, fire under feet, hot blood in your belly. It's not something you ever thought about doing, and so when you did, you carried the anthem under your breath, waiting until the airport toilet to tear up the passport and swallow, each mouthful of paper making it clear that you would not be going back. You have to understand, no one puts their children in a boat unless the water is safer than the land. Who would choose to spend days and nights in the stomach of a truck unless the miles traveled meant something more than journey? No one would choose to crawl under fences, be beaten until your shadow leaves you, raped, then drowned, forced to the bottom of the boat because you are darker. Be sold, starved, shot at the border like a sick animal. Be pitied, lose your name, lose your family. Make a refugee camp a home for a year or two or ten. Stripped and searched. Find prison everywhere. And if you survive and you are greeted on the other side with go home blacks, refugees, dirty immigrants, asylum seekers, sucking our country drive milk, dark with their hands out, smell strange, savage. Look what they've done to their own country. What will they do to ours? The dirty looks in the street softer than a limb torn off. The indignity of everyday life more tender than 14 men who look like your father between your legs. Insults easier to swallow than rubble, than your child's body in pieces. For now, forget about pride. Your survival is more important. I want to go home, but home is the mouth of a shark. Home is the barrel of the gun. And no one would leave home unless home chased you to the shore. Unless home yells you to leave what you could not behind. Even if it was human. No one leaves home until home is a damp voice in your ear saying, leave, run now. I don't know what I've become. And this is what migrants that come into the United States experience. That's... Yeah. It takes empathy. And... Why don't people have empathy? Well, because they themselves haven't been treated with empathy. Mm. So part of this whole <clears throat> problem is, is is trying to create an empathetic lens through which they might be able to relate yeah. to these issues. You know what I mean? Totally. And maybe bluegrass is a good a good way for some of them to cultivate a heightened sense of empathy for migrants. And that's what we're that's what that's what we're trying to propose with these songs in this work. Come friends, come friends, come gather round for to sing, sing we joyfully. Let's sing about a better world where different paths have been unfurled of a land where freedom reigns. From way up high on a mountainside, one can see the wide world over. From way up there is plain to see Regardless of one's race or creed And our hearts were all the same Come sisters, brothers, gather near For we've come to share our worry We fear what some folks have been saying About Latin Americans The truth's been misconstrued There's all kinds of talk about building a wall Down along the southern border but building a wall between me and you Lord, and if such nonsense should come true Then we'll have to knock, knock it down Cause that idea won't fly so high, high As a wingless bird in a rock hard sky. sky So no siree, we won't comply okay. We're going to stand our ground. ground To love thy neighbor as thyself Is a righteous law to live by But we sing a different song They break us up so they stay strong And ignorantly we're strung along Until we meet our doom Yes, our leaders are so ripe with sin. sin They feed us chance to rope us sin. in But someday soon we'll find my friends, friends That were pinned against the wall 
Come friends, come friends, come gather round For to sing, oh sing we joyfully Let us sing about a better world Where better paths will soon unfurl Where no man's blood shall stain the soul Of a land where freedom rings That sounds so good, guys. Love it. Gospel bluegrass, man. Yeah, it's good music. Holy crap. <laughs> bluegrass is a really powerful genre of music we've come to figure out. Yeah. It means a lot. What does it, it mean? It means that globalization is okay in a way. It also means that rural art forms can be incredibly sophisticated, difficult, and that... Uh, that Unlike many genres of folk music, it can be imported around, exported throughout the world and, and re-imported and, and, and sliced and diced in many kinds of ways. And that high lonesome sound, man, some people just relate to it for some reason. Even a, a Mexican boy, two Argentinians, and a, and a gay fiddler. <laughs> so, so I have a dream that would be a potluck dinner block party where everyone for all, from all the different cultures made their favorite food. And all the musicians played their favorite tunes. And everyone got together, heard the music, and tasted the food. How can music save the world? Well, uh, if music weren't there, <laughs> then the world wouldn't be worth saving. Yeah, That's what I can say. Yeah, totally. ah. That's great. I could not say that any better. Nice. <laughs> that, was good, that was good, Paul. Thank you. All right, next question. Don't put to my TikTok. <laughs> A lot of people in America don't leave but you have traveled how does traveling the world create more tolerance because until you have been the foreigner and you've been outed in public when you've been trying to buy cheese or something and you and you, and, and you get looked at funny and you get talked about you don't fully understand what's being said you feel that migrant experience mm -hmm. then you will definitely have empathy unless you are a crazy person and then you will just say well this place sucks and i'm going back to my place <laughs> and that there's a lot of people like that unfortunately that's right what i could add up to what he's saying is yeah. i believe that if you grow up in a very closed environment kind of with the same people with the same culture with everything the same it's always a little bit scary the unknown so if somebody else comes that's different at of what you've always known in your life it can be scary i understand that but if then if you are from this close environment and then you travel the world then a lot of unknown things start being normal and the unknown by itself starts being normal it's like okay i'm now getting used to being surprised to something being unexpected to something being different mm. and that may uh, build acceptance you know yeah Visit JAppalachia.com to purchase t-shirts and their Grammy-nominated music on CD and on vinyl. Special thanks to our patrons. None of this would be possible without the River of Suck swim team. Stay in touch and download all the bonus content, deleted scenes, outtakes, and more music by becoming a member for just $1 a month at riverofsuckswimteam.com. No one ever said crossing the River of Suck would be easy or that you had to do it alone, so I want to thank you for tuning in and giving it a chance. My name is Andy Reiner. We are Che Apalache! Gracias. Gracias. Till next time, keep, keep swimming. swimming! Thank you. Yeah, man. <laughs> yeah. That's cool. Andy, what's up, dude? Oh man, Joe Troop. <laughs> what is happening? Oh man, well, you know, I just wanted to check in because um, I guess I should just catch everyone up on what happened to Chiapalache. We were mid tour when the pandemic hit, and so there was some split second decision making going on. Um, let's see, March fifth. I'm sorry, the previous Thursday, whatever that was. I think it was the. Uh, 12th or something yeah um we were driving up to indiana from north carolina and our gig got canceled and so we we're like oh wow big years had already been canceled um and a couple other gigs had been canceled but that was like damn we yesterday
yesterday, it was on today, it's off. So we hold up at a friend at my friend John Hamlet's house for a couple of days. In that time, we realized, oh, this is, yeah, this is done. <laughs> so <laughs> we had to go through getting emergency plane tickets back uh, to Latin America for the guys. Paul decided to go to Mexico on a whim. He's just like, I'll go to Mexico. And then Franco and Martino were like, well, uh, we should go to Buenos Aires. And uh, Argentina had already announced that all commercial flights to the country were going to be suspended by next Tuesday. So imagine, you know, like every Argentinian uh, in North America that wanted to get back to Argentina tried to leave. Ooh. There were no flights. So <laughs> we bought, I think, in the process before we actually got a flight that existed, we went through like three flights. So just imagine the, like, you know, bleeding out money. Uh, plus they jacked up their prices and it was just this big cluster cluck. So anyway, we ended up getting them a flight. I dropped them off at the airport on Monday in Nashville. We did play a gig in Nashville that Sunday. Um, Sunday, March 15th. And they, uh, I was, Paul had been able to get out on Monday to Mexico. Franco and Martin got to the airport and then they were told they didn't have a flight. The flight didn't exist. So then I, you know, somehow did some finagling and finally ended up getting a flight and we were expecting a deja vu. I found something out of Charlotte. So we hightailed it to North Carolina and I got them to Charlotte the next day and then they flew out. Um, they flew to Brazil and they somehow got back in Argentina. So it was kind of like, they literally got on the last commercial flight to Argentina. Um, and wow. now everything is closed until at least September. Yeah. And, uh, so then enter in phase two of pandemic reckoning. We go through, you know, the accounting nightmare of, okay, so, um, a one week tour, we played four. Wow. <laughs> we have flights booked all over the country. We have <laughs> hotels, we have, Airbnbs, oh. vehicles, all hell in student. We're just now finishing that process with the accountants and management. So wow. I have been in bureaucratic hell. And uh, the USCIS has uh, the United States Customs and Immigration Services is being, has, you know, they, I, there must have been some sort of uh, executive orders to, you know, be stricter with visas. We've had the guys have been on work visas two full years now, this is going into our third, you know, third visa renewal, our second visa renewal, third visa year applicable. But, um, you know, even with a Grammy nomination and all the other accolades we had, we got a uh, request for more explanations. So now we're in a little bit of a legal um, issue trying to see if we can get the guys back into the United States on work visas. So it's, on an infrastructural level, things have been kind of like uh, helter-skelter. Nonetheless, um, we've all made lemonade out of lemons. Franco and Martin are holed up in Buenos Aires. You know, it's much, much, much stricter down there. They haven't opened up at all. And it's been, a, it's been a kind of quarantine where if you go on the streets, you get asked where you're going. You have to show identification and only certain days of the week are you allowed to go to certain places like the bank and whatnot. You have to wow. get in a queue and you have to apply to get yeah. And so the whole country has like 230 cases, I think. Ooh. Like, I think there's yeah. li literally, not, they haven't, they don't even have 500 cases. I, I think, I think those numbers are right. If they have, they might have 600, but I don't know. I don't think they have a thousand cases. I, I don't know the exact numbers. I just know they've done, they've contained it very well, especially right. compared to the United States. Um, but life is kind of, it, it's, it's worse. You can't even get out and get out, you know, go walk. Paul is in Mexico. They've been a little bit uh, looser. With that, um, he is uh, holed up in his dad's house. He does get to walk around the block and stuff. But his plan was to hunker down in Mexico for a month and then go to back to Buenos Aires. And my plan was to go back to Buenos Aires uh, with the flight that I had already you know, originally booked, which was going to take me back uh, like May 1st. That didn't happen. So um, I, I stayed in North Carolina. I guess I had an unplanned uh, move back to the state. So I'm, I've re integrated in American society um, at a time when you can't really see anyone. It's kind of crazy, but uh, Bao has done the same thing. We're both living out of the suitcase that we brought on tour. Uh, wow. And that, that's it, all of our stuff. Yeah. So it's been a really nice, uh, for me, it's like an expose in minimalism and in solidarity and community. So I, I've actually, uh, you know, I, I, I feel okay, ups and downs, but I'll, I'll, by and large, I'm, I'm, I've been 
fooling around with the idea of immigrating back to Appalachia for a while. I really love the mountains. I really love stirring the curd. And, and I feel like there's a need for me here right now as a political activist and music-making activist. Stirring and so the curd. that's what I'm doing. Um, <laughs> Stirring the curd, baby. Stirring the curd. Spread the word. <laughs> Stirring the curd. Yeah. That's my turd, y'all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's uh that's my life in a nutshell. Wow. And that's the band's life in a nutshell. Yeah. That's crazy. I bet you had I mean you had no idea when you were packing that suitcase how long you were gonna live out of that suitcase. <laughs> no, but you know what? It, Interestingly enough, um, I you know I went through a phase in my life where I was uh, in a domestic partnership. You know, I was married. I'm, I'm still married legally, but I have separated from my ex husband, who's just an amazing, amazing person that I love dearly. But we decided that our life paths were not going in the same direction, so we split up right before this tour. And this tour was going to be over the course of like two months, two and a half months. So it was going to span from uh, like winter in Colorado to uh, basically right now in North Carolina, like spring, right. like, you know, with an occasional hot day. So I, 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 I brought garb for all seasons. And on my last tour, for some reason, I got this, like, bug in my ear, take your banjo, take your banjo back to the States. So I just left my bluegrass banjo in the States last year, and thankfully it's here, and I've been able to really reconnect with the banjo. And, uh, and my friend Anya lent me a 51 Gibson guitar for triple O, beautiful x ray I think it's just a wonderful little machine. And uh, and I've been playing that all day. So, you know, I mean, I'm kind of fulfilling one of the fantasies I've had for a long time, which is just come back to Appalachia. And I've lived out of the, out of the country for like 14 years. Mm. And uh, quite frankly, I just miss my mountains. I miss the flowers and the trees and the birds and the bees and, and the, <laughs> you know, and and hippies and hillbillies and and, and Rickies and Randys and you know and, <laughs> yeah man <laughs> and good southern cooking I'm fat as I'm getting fat too I'm gonna start hiking this week so I there you get go. the man boob action toned down a little bit yeah <laughs> man so last time I saw you was was in this alternate universe where bands played on stages for people who paid money to all be together and listen to music live in one room. And before that, earlier that day, you guys were in my house, like people, several, like not even six feet, just like real close, just in a, in our living room. And we were hanging out. That's, and my gosh, that was a whole other thing that we're, (laughs) it seems so far away now. (laughs) It does. It does. You know, but even reminiscing and missing it, that's going to be like, Oh, that was so April. That's so May. We're going to be all like, you know, once, uh, Oh God, actually, I don't know. In the United States, who knows what's going to happen? You know, North Carolina just reopened. So we'll see how that goes. Uh, there's a lot of cavalier behavior regarding the virus around these parts. So it's a little bit disconcerting. And yet there isn't, I mean, I understand the economic implications because a lot of people are, um, up the street without a paddle and they need money. And, uh, so what you going to do? I mean, uncle Sam ain't bailing us out. So what's the best way that we could support, Che Appalachia during this time now that we can't go to your shows I myself am not teaching at the moment because I'm I, I burned out on teaching you know I, I taught a whole generation of bluegrass players in Argentina I just taught I taught while everyone else was playing gig and gigging I was basically teaching uh, for a decade so I'm, I'm kind of I, I don't want to do that but the guys in my band are teaching if anyone wants lessons from Paul Martin or Franco it'd be great to reach out um I, I am doing, you know, live shows and stuff. People ask me to do it, and it's kind of fun. I like getting asked to do that kind of stuff. We obviously can't do it as a band. Uh, right. I, you know, I'm, I'm going to be doing that individually. Um, and uh, the other guys might be, too. I, you know, we haven't really discussed at length what, what they want to do. I think technologically they're not as well 
set up to do that kind of thing yet. Uh, I think Paul said he was working on that. So I don't know. Definitely reaching out to people to them and and, and uh, you know classes that would be really cool. I think also um, I'm gonna be we're in the talks with management about printing up some more T-shirts. So there might be some T-shirts. We're gonna need to cover you know more legal fees because even amidst the pandemic, it's, it's funny. <laughs> uh, entities are willing to to make it harder for international bands to even be in the United States. So there's, I'm going to get the fabulous unicorn sharding our band name t-shirt, which you bought, Andy. I'm going to oh, yeah. get those things back online pretty soon and become a t-shirt salesman. Even though packing t-shirts is kind of a pain in the rumpus, uh, we're going to figure out how to do that, sell some, sell some shirts. But I don't know, you know, a, a friendly howdy every once in a while goes a long way too. So everyone just take care of yourselves and make sure to come see us when we actually put something, you know, together in the future and we can get back up here. You know, that's the thing. Don't forget about us. This is the best thing we you know, we were we were gaining some momentum. We don't want to become just this obsolete what was the name of that band? Back in <laughs> two thousand nineteen. <laughs> You know, the gay guy on fiddle, and <laughs> the guy with the hair on banjo, and, and the funny guy on mandolin, and the quiet, sensible guy on guitar. Yeah. <laughs> What's the name of that band? <laughs> Tim, who cares? <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, yeah, don't do that. If you do that, I'm like, whoops, I'm <laughs> up my hair. <laughs> Nice, man. <laughs> come, friends, come, friends, come gather round for to sing, oh, sing we joyfully. Let us sing about a better world. Where better paths will soon unfurl, where no man's blood shall stain the soul of a land where freedom reigns.